Today's video is brought to you by Squarespace. More on them a little bit later. Welcome back to Sonic Speed Reading. And before we get into anything, I do apologize for the more clickbaity title. Your boy hasn't uploaded in a while, I'm sorry. So to give you my answer straight up front here, Lanolin is not the new Sally, but there are some very obvious parallels I do have to discuss. And that aside, Lanolin does deserve a discussion because she has been here for a while, a lot longer than even I realized. But before we can do any of that, we do have to summarize issues issues 57 and 58 of the IDW Sonic series. Because not only is that a part of the show, it will help better inform my opinions and my comparisons and everything else. So let's kick things off with issues 57, which sees the return of Ian Flynn as head writer. I know he's wrapped up his work on Frontiers quite a while back, but I think this is the first time we've seen his name on a comic script since the game's release, and it's nice to see him still jumping in and out of stories here. We also have art by Adam Bryce Tom, which is fitting considering he's Lanolin's creator. Colors by Matt Hearns. Letters by Sean Lee, with editors Riley Farmer and David Marriott. I have been making more of an effort to shout out the folks who work on this book, but I also need to take a quick second to give a heartfelt shout out to all the folks affected by IDW's mass layoff last month. I've been seeing a lot of discourse on whether or not this means that the Sonic series will get scrapped. It, look, I'm sure the brand is going to be fine. More importantly, 39% of the IDW workforce has been shown the door, and that sucks. I really hope everybody lands on their feet. Very honored I got to meet some of those amazing folks, and I'm looking forward to whatever you guys end up doing next. But with all that said, let's carry on to the story itself. The issue picks up with Lanolin overlooking the Imperial City. This has been the backdrop for a few of the previous stories, and it looks like the Restoration is finally looking to do something about it. The Sheep is leading a recon crew consisting of Sonic, Tangle, Whisper, and this little purple music note, Wisp. Lanolin surveys the city, noting that she can't see any signs of traps or patrols, which she finds strange, almost as if Eggman wants the city to be invaded. And that's all Sonic and Tangle need to rush towards the city, with Whisper and Lanolin looking on in distress and frustration. The Hedgehog, Lemur, Adrenaline Junkie duo start wrecking badniks, with Sonic noting that they seem to be spread thinner since his last visit. With his leg fully healed, he looks ready to properly tackle this new egg base. And these are just the first of the large variety of classic badniks we will be seeing, including including the Death Egg Red Eye Mini Boss. And I know this is a weird little nitpick and also probably just a bit of headcanon on my part, but I've only really ever associated this particular robot with the Death Egg. Like I always thought it was part of the Death Egg itself. And it being a mini boss, I always assumed there was only one, but Sonic Forces showed us plenty of red eyes in the background of their Death Egg. I don't know, I just thought it was weird seeing it outside of a Death Egg. Either way, it's nice to see it for the short time it is here because it's taken out in the very next page as the frustrated duo of sheep and wolf, and saying that out loud, I'm just realizing how weird it is pairing a sheep and wolf together, as Lanolin finally shows off what she can do. With the flick of her cowbell, she immobilizes the red eye, setting Whisper up to take it out with a well-aimed shot. Now, you might be wondering how Lanolin managed to do that. Well, we get it explained to us in the story itself, but just to jump ahead a little bit on that one, when I was first reading this story, I was under the impression that the magenta wisp was another one of Whisper's, as she's the character most associated with Wisps in this series. But the more attentive fan might have noticed that Whisper doesn't have a Magenta Wisp among her crew. Turns out that this one is partnered with Lanolin, going by the name of Maggie. And it turns out that the bell Lanolin wears around her neck is actually a Wispin. And when combined with Maggie, it produces this cool ability. Now we will see it used for a different reason later on, and we don't know if it just immobilizes robots or any particular target. There's a lot left for us to actually figure out, but as it stands, they did design a really cool ability to go along with a fantastic accessory to a fantastic character design. Sonic compliments the duo's work, but is met with a stern scolding from Lanolin, asking Sonic if they forgot why they were there, which is our cue for flashback as the comic jumps back in time to Restoration HQ with Sonic arriving on the scene. He had been asked there by Jewel, and even though he isn't technically a part of the Restoration group, he is always happy to help them out if needed, and they want him because he's one of the few who 
who has been to and survived the newly built Imperial City. Obviously, it's a major cause for concern, and Lanolin wants to put together a small crew that can infiltrate the base, survey it, learn as much as they can, and regroup to create a battle plan to take it down properly. Sonic, of course, agrees, and then asks if there's a team name. Twitch Tangle immediately responds with Diamond Cutters, which was the name of Whisper's team that was ruthlessly slaughtered and deeply traumatized her, which is a story she has told Tangle, so I have no idea why the lemur thought that would be a good idea, because it gets the response you would expect from Whisper, silently upset. This does get noticed by Tangle, but not by Sonic and Lanolin, who is telling the hedgehog she's been looking forward to working with him for quite a while, and Sonic apologizes, asking if they've even met before, and Lanolin responds with yes, but it was brief, and she lays out not only to Sonic, but to us as the readers, that she's been around for quite a while. She tells them that they had briefly met a long while ago when her town had been attacked, and that was all the way back in issue 2. And yeah, I went back and checked myself. I have noticed her cameos here and there, but I completely forgot or overlooked that she has been here since the second issue. I thought her first spoken words happened much later, sometime during the Metal Virus, but nope, she spoke during her very first appearance. And it seems that ever since that brief encounter, Lanlin has been inspired by Sonic's bravery and dedicated herself to help others as well, which is what eventually led her to the restoration. And now, to here, where she not only created the mission idea, but is going to lead it herself on the field. And that's when we cut back to the present. With Tangle apologizing for jumping in as fast as she did, she's still getting the hang of the whole team dynamic situation, but she is trying. And Sonic says that slow and stealthy really isn't his style. The exhausted Lanolin rubs her head, asking Whisper how she puts up with this, and the wolf just says that she doesn't. And when Tangle asks Whisper if they need to talk about something, she just gets the cold shoulder. But no real time to deal with the awkwardness. They are now in the city proper, so Sonic asks Lanolin if they should keep heading into the city, but the sheep would like to first assess their surroundings, asking Whisper if her hover wisp can take this device, which kind of looks like an old MP3 player or one of those Famicom clone machines that you can get off AliExpress. Anyway, she asks the wisp to take it high above the city. Not exactly sure what that thing is, but Lanolin has a matching device and she's using the pair to compare data of the city from Sonic's previous visit to confirm that the city has actually grown since last time. But she is working with limited data, so they may have to survey from a different location. But Sonic has another idea. He merges with the Hover Wisp to launch himself up above the city to look at a very particular part of it. This is actually where Metal Sonic wrecked their initial escape plan, which we saw back in issues 51 and 52. As Sonic points out, Eggman isn't the type to clean up after himself. It looks like the fight never even took place. The city isn't just getting bigger, it's also healing itself. So the crew put their heads together to figure out where to go next. Lanolin says that if the city is growing and healing like a living organism, then it needs resources to pull from. Sonic is very familiar with Eggman's mining equipment. It's real hard to miss, and he hasn't seen any signs of it anywhere. But Tangle points out that the trees in the surrounding area are in real bad shape, meaning they aren't getting their proper nutrients from the soil below. So it's possible that the resources are being pulled from somewhere underground. That's when Sonic remembers that Bell said at one point that there is a network of underground tunnels under the city. I mean, that is where she watched a certain platypus get crushed after all. So with all of that said, the heroes decide to track down said tunnels. Cautiously, as Lanolin says to the disappointed Sonic and Tangle. We get a fun page of action as the heroes make their way to elevators and through badniks until they finally reach the lowest possible point of the city, a concrete wall at the dead end. To get past the wall, Whisper clears a path with her Wispin and Tangle lowers herself and Lanolin into complete darkness. The she rings her cowbell and the rhythm power of Maggie echoes around lighting up the surroundings which I guess is another thing it can do which cool all right and all they see is a vast empty cavern they return to the surface where Sonic asks if they found anything and Lanolin says there's nothing which is the problem no plants nutrients minerals anything you'd normally expect to find in underground caverns at least in Sonic's world they're still not entirely sure how but the city is stripping the world of its resources and it could potentially do this until the entire planet is consumed Consumed. So clearly they have to do something about it. Lanolin feels that they have enough data and they need to regroup properly at Restoration HQ. But Sonic pushes back. The team is here now, and he already knows that Eggman is up in that big tower in the middle of the city, so they might as well take care of the problem while they're here. Lanolin argues that the team is barely tested, as we have clearly seen at the start of this issue, and they need to go back and marshal their forces. To which Sonic asks, how much bigger will the city 
get while they're doing that. While those two debate, Tangle says they both make good points, and Whisper attempts a compromise, telling Tangle to fall back while the wolf sticks around in the city to keep scouting. This gets a loud no from Tangle, saying that Whisper just survived a close call while going solo and she needs to quit that nonsense. And the close call she's referring to, if you're not aware, was when she was absolutely schooled by a beefed up Surge. But before any debates can carry on, a strange device, or well, a ring of strange devices anyway, appears in front of our heroes and it lights up to create a portal. The same type we saw back in issues 37 through 40. Or for those of you only keeping track by speed reading episodes, that was the one where Sonic ended up in the back rooms. And being the old man I am, I had no idea that the back rooms were a thing until I saw the comments of that video, so thank you guys for turning me on to that. I know it's played out and tired by now, but I still think it's a fun concept. Anyway, the portable portal rushes towards our heroes, who run away best they can, with Tangle grabbing Lanolin and Whisper with her tail, while Sonic grabs the lemur by the hand, using his speed to drag the rest of them along. But unfortunately, they're ambushed by a bunch of badniks, including these turtleoids. I'm so happy these guys are getting so much love in recent issues. With the approaching portal and the surrounding badniks, this means they can't use the elevator to get back up. So Sonic has to use the badniks and his speed to bounce his way up the elevator shaft. And just as they clear it, a zoomer dashes between the hands of Tangle and Sonic, breaking their grip and sending the lemur, as well as Lanolin and Whisper, into the portal. Those damn zoomers always ruining everything when it comes to Sonic, am I right? But that's the name of the hummingbird badniks. Don't blame me, I didn't name them. Sonic dodges a few more zoomers, but ends up surrounded by a slew of attacking badniks. And while he's not proud of it, he has to call Jewel, asking for backup. Now, before we get on to our next issue, I want to take a moment to thank our sponsor, Squarespace. If you're trying to build an online business or you want to set up a nice little space to show off your creative skills with a portfolio, or even if you wanted to just put together a creative gift, there are so many ways to take advantage of a web page. And Squarespace makes it as easy as possible. They have a huge variety of templates, fonts, color palettes, everything you need to show off your unique style without it being overwhelming. And it doesn't just stop at looks. You can take advantage of their behind the scenes analytics to see where your customers or viewers are coming from. They can pull all your social media accounts into one hub and help send out any messages or advertisements or whatever you have from one convenient spot and give you any notification from any of those websites there as well. Everything you need to build a proper marketing strategy to help you grow as a creator or as a business or really whatever you want. It's never been this easy to mark your place in the digital frontier. Go take a look for yourself. I've only mention a handful of features they offer. You can get a free trial going over at squarespace.com, and if you want to take the plunge, head over to squarespace.com slash gameapologist and get 10% off your first purchase of a website or domain. Thank you again to Squarespace for sponsoring this video, and let's get back to it. Issue 58 picks up with the same creative team, except for the art now being switched out to Thomas Roethlisberger. That's the first time I've said that name, I'm assuming it's pronounced phonetically, but I've had to be corrected in the past, so if anyone knows better, be sure you hit me up in the comments. And the story picks back up with Sonic holding out against the Badnik Assault. Normally these are no problem, but with their high numbers, they are giving him a workout, and they aren't giving him a moment to figure out how to help the other Diamond Cutters. But thankfully the Horde is quickly sorted as a large bunch of them are crunched together and then blasted with a huge fireball, and one last egg pawn is quickly torn to shreds by a spin attack and a pico hammer to the face. Sonic's reinforcements have arrived in the form of Amy, Tails, Blaze, and Silver. Nice to see them again, and yet they've been around since the last annual issue. Haven't covered that yet, I've been meaning to, so let me know if you guys would like to see that. Now with things calmed down, Sonic can get the crew caught up to speed with everything that's happened so far, and Ian does something I've noticed a couple times before in previous stories. He clears up any potential loopholes that could pop up with the broken powers of these animal people. They explain that the soul emeralds, time traveling, and dimension hopping won't exactly work here by pointing out some limitations. Silver can't freely time travel, and Blaze can only hop between this dimension and her home one. So all of those abilities are out of the question in terms of tracking down Tangle, Lanolin, and Whisper. That limits their options to egg tech. Tails has pointed out how tricky it is to use in the past, but he has managed to reverse engineer it before. That's going to be their best bet. But first, the fox wants to examine one of the many giant crystals protruding all around the city. Turns out they're more than just decoration. They do serve a purpose we will find out soon, as the crew rushes towards the closest crystal, not realizing that Tangle is right behind 
behind them, yelling for their attention to no avail. Seems that the portal hasn't so much thrown them into a new dimension, but has just made them intangible and undetectable. They're invisible to the rest of the world. They're practically ghosts. Frustrated, Tangle turns to Lanolin for a plan, but unfortunately, the sheep lady feels completely defeated. She may seem bossy, but she is inexperienced. This is still her first mission after all, and unfortunately, she's completely overwhelmed, saying she isn't cut out for this type of stuff. Tangle tries to reassure her, but Lanolin isn't hearing any of it, saying she only formed this team out of desperation. After that first badnik attack she experienced all the way back in issue 2, she felt helpless, and she was determined to never feel that way again, or let anybody feel that way. But now they're here in this mess on her very first mission. She had led them to this, and she's taking all the responsibility onto herself. Tangle reassures her that mistakes happen. She's made more than her fair share, and she's had to rely on Jewel to bail her out. Everyone makes mistakes, and all you can really do is learn from them and do better. Lanolin doesn't have to shoulder all of this on her own. She has her whole team backing her up, but when Tangle looks to whisper to back her up, the wolf just asks why, shifting the topic to the team name, the Diamond Cutters. Tangle knows that backstory. She knows what Whisper endured. So why did the lemur think it was a good idea to use that of all titles for the team name? Tangle apologizes. That's not the way she saw it. To the lemur, the Diamond Cutters were close friends. They were cool and competent. She just wanted to give Whisper that feeling again, that camaraderie. And while I personally still think it was rather boneheaded, even for Tangle's character, the lemur has noticed how distant Whisper still is when it comes to a team setting, and how bad things went the last time the wolf went solo. I'll be honest, this does still feel a little bit forced. I remember reading the preview pages for the opening of this issue and thought, why on earth, Tangle? Why would you do that? But to be fair, being a part of the team was an important part of Whisper's life prior to this point. And Tangle balls, apologizing again, saying that she was caught up in the moment. And Lanolin, who wasn't aware of the fate of the previous Diamond Cutters, says that they can still change the team name. She doesn't want to be offensive, but Whisper stops her. She now understands what Tangle was trying to do, and does say that the old Diamond Cutters were there for each other, and their Wisps were, and still are, a part of her team, her family. And Sonic, Bell, Tails, Tangle, all of them have been there for Whisper, but she doesn't feel like she has been there for them. Still, Lanolin does understand if Whisper does have trust issues, but Whisper understands that only one person took her team from her. Only one person hurt her. The Restoration, Tangle, everyone else has had Whisper's back. She apologizes for being a bad team member and a bad friend, but still asks for patience. She's still going to need time to move on. And having sorted the insecurities and the drama, the girls hug it out and come up with a plan for what to do next. They're going to trust Sonic and the rest to figure out a way to bring them back. So in the meantime, they're going to take advantage of being able to scout the city without being detected. And once they finally regroup with the other heroes, they'll have a ton of data ready to go. Lionelin sends Maggie out and the three others head towards the central tower, that being the most obvious starting point. From there, we turn our attention back to the tangible heroes, holding out against a new onslaught of badniks as Tails makes his way to the base of one of the crystals, connecting its wiring to his handy tablet. While that's going on, we get a cool little bit of action as Silver helps Amy grab one of the giant hammers of a super padnik and sends it smashing down on its face. And I love that Silver points out that Amy did most of the lifting there. Knuckles and Mighty get all the attention when it comes to strength, but Amy is low-key one of their best powerhouses. And she was a speed character in Heroes, too. Girls an all-around badass. The heroes cheer about it because why wouldn't they? That was awesome. And Tails is a little bummed out because, well, he missed something cool. But he has discovered what the giant crystals actually are. They're giant, fake chaos emeralds. Blaze is stunned, asking if Eggman can replicate them so easily. And Tails says, yes, he can. These crystals have the same energy wavelength and properties, but in comparison, they are woefully underpowered. But they're still more potent than chaos drives or power cores, both game elements that have never been fully explained, but we have seen them in the book previously. And I do actually appreciate the comic using these crystals in this way. Sonic Adventure 2 established that fake emeralds are a thing. Tails made one himself. And when you consider how often two of the smartest Sonic characters have handled and studied these incredibly powerful gemstones, it does make sense that Eggman would utilize that research in Badnik and weapon production. I mean, he did that all the way back in Sonic 3 and Knuckles. Still, he can't completely recreate a Chaos Emerald. Not perfectly, anyway. Which is why these crystals are so huge. To compensate for the energy 
energy production. And unlike a real emerald, that energy isn't produced by the crystals themselves. They have to be fueled by something, which is why they're sucking up all the natural resources. Then again, while it is a game mechanic, super forms, while they are instigated by the emeralds, do need rings to keep the forms going. And it's still really weird that the rings haven't been seen anywhere in the IDW series. Why wouldn't Eggman just use rings? I mean, he did that in the Archie's... <sighs> Never mind, forget it. Maybe the rings are a part of the natural resources getting sucked up. It's just strange that we have not seen them anywhere in the IDW series. That aside, I do love how quickly they establish how these characters handle situations. Sonic streamlines the explanation to simply, big crystals bad, so destroy them and you take out the problem. So he and Silver get ready to wreck them, only to be stopped by Blaze and Tails. The Fox says that would be a bad idea. These crystals are trying to replicate Chaos Emerald energy after all. Destroying one could lead to catastrophic results. Tails says that it would blow up plenty of the city, sure, but the heroes would be blown up in the process, and the city would just eat up more resources to rebuild itself. Each crystal powers a portion of the Imperial City, but they are all connected and controlled from that central tower that I keep mentioning. The best bet is taking that out before doing anything else. And, as Tails points out, it's also the best bet for Tails to reverse engineer the portal tech to save the diamond cutters. And I love the sass that Silver gives Sonic about needing a delicate touch right after he himself was ready to go in with the destroy everything idea. As they rush off towards the tower, Sonic does take a moment to reflect on what Lanlin had said, agreeing with her about the importance of teamwork. But that thought is interrupted by an explosion. Sonic tells Amy, Blaze, and Silver to keep heading towards the tower while he and Tails go check out said explosion. The two fly off, noticing a bunch of wrecked badniks, and Sonic asks if Jewel had sent any other reinforcements, but Tails isn't aware of any, and the two look down to see Omega, Rouge, and Shadow demolishing a horde of badniks. Team Dark has finally returned to the series, and that is where issue 58 ends. Alright, gonna take a breather here, so for those of you who get mad at the analysis part of these videos, you can peace out here. Thanks for hanging out. Well, unless you're watching this in a compilation later, I'm sure a time code's around here somewhere. Really gotta start adding those. Anyway, for now, we're gonna focus up a little bit on what we have read these past two issues, a bit more on Lanolin, and some glaring parallels I am seeing. Like I said, it's been a long time coming, but yes, we finally have Lanolin front and center with not only a story, but a name as well. The fanbase has known her name for quite a while. The creative team has been calling her that all over Twitter for forever, but only in these past two issues has it been made official. Apparently, Sega is somewhat worried about naming and introducing new characters. I don't know if it's because they worry about the fervent fan bases that form around these characters, because good lord, is that a common thing in this community? And yes, I will be talking about some particular abandoned characters in just a second. Prepare to roll your eyes, you zoo- uh, robotic hummingbirds. <laughs> Whatever the reasoning is, you can't keep a good design down, and the writers and artists for IDW Sonic not only have years of experience with this franchise, but they've had even more experience being Sonic fans. This franchise is over 30 years old, and I will keep saying it, even if the guidelines are stricter these days, I am loving that Sonic fans are making Sonic content. I think it's clear that Adam had a great time designing Lanolin, and wanted to keep using that design whenever possible. And the fans took notice. They fell in love with this character long before she had, well, character. I have noticed her design more than a couple times, and I assume this was a fairly obvious trope of dropping a future villain in super early. I mean, her design was so well thought out, you couldn't help but notice her anytime she showed up, especially after they finalized that outfit. I absolutely adore her design. But yeah, it turns out I was dead wrong. I noticed her the most during the Metal Virus while she was glaring at Sonic or fearful of him when he jumped onto the back of her chair, but really who can blame her for those reactions? Sonic was infected himself, and one touch from him, and she'd be done for. As we would come to find out in these recent issues, Lanlin just wants to do some good for the world. She can be serious and somewhat bossy. She wants to go by the guidelines and think things through. She is very level-headed, but at the same time, her inexperience still comes out and causes her some grief. She does take the role of leadership very seriously, and when things go bad, she blames herself before she blames anybody else. She clearly has what it takes to lead a team. She's not a leader for the sake of her ego. She truly does 
want what is best for the rest of the people she's looking out for. But she still has a lot of learning to do. Being a leader does mean coordinating and, yeah, looking out for the rest of the team. But you can't forget that you are still a part of a team and sometimes you're gonna need help. You can still lean on them, trust them, and rely on them. Just as you would for anybody else in your crew. As Tangle said, mistakes happen. Everybody makes them. All you can really do is learn from them. Pick yourself up and try to do better. Lanolin has what it takes to be a good leader, and in many ways, she already is. But she's still new to this, and she is going to screw up. But if she keeps Tangle's words close to her heart, she will learn the right lessons and become a great leader. And I hope she does. I'd like to see her stick around. And while I was never a big Wisp guy, they are still here. And like Whisper has shown me before, I do like to see them used in creative ways like this. Lanolin doesn't have superpower abilities like most of the rest of the main cast, but that cowbell does even the playing field a little bit. It's a really cool idea, and it does introduce the Magenta Wisp, which I don't think we've seen used anywhere in this book yet. Could be mistaken, but yeah. I do hope they better clarify exactly what she can do with the cowbell wispin. Does it generate a certain sound that messes up robots? Echolocation generates light, I guess? I don't know, but sound based powers sound pretty cool. I am interested to see what else they do with that idea. So yeah, I love this design, I love the abilities, and I'm already enjoying the character I have seen so far. But with all that said, I once again have to point out some glaring comparisons to a certain freedom fighter. And I know I'm going to get it in the comments, I see it every single time I mention a character in relation to <laughs> Sally Acorn, and the angry retorts come in one of two flavors. Just because there's a female leader in the world of Sonic doesn't automatically make her Sally. And two, what's the point of the freedom fighter? if we now have characters able to take their place. I understand not everyone is making those two same arguments, but you can see a little bit of a contradiction if you place them side by side, right? It's a bit of a headache. And I promise I will spare you guys most of that particular argument in a dedicated Freedom Fighters video, so you can just watch that instead of having to deal with it here. But yes, I do think there's an obvious comparison to make between Sally and Lanolin. And yeah, I have pointed that out between Amy Rose early on in this book and a little bit with Jewel, and that's because we have seen similar character arcs with both of them prior to this point, and they are filling a very particular role in a very particular situation that Sega keeps reusing. Difference is, all of these other characters have found a breaking point somewhere. Amy takes charge of the freedom, <clears throat> sorry, the resistance, and says, oh, I can't do it. Then Jewel takes charge of the restoration and says, oh, I can't do it. Then Lanolin takes charge of the diamond cutters and says, oh, gosh, I can't do this. I'm not cut out for this. And let's be completely fair. Each of these characters are their own characters in their own right. They have left their mark and found their place in the story, and I'm sure Lanlin will do the same. Amy transformed the Resistance into the Restoration, which is more focused on helping rebuild the world instead of taking it back. Jewel is well organized and well suited to the behind the scenes bookkeeping and task mastering. And again, we've only had a couple of issues with Lanlin being front and center, and I'm sure she's going to prove herself leading a team capable on the field. I don't need to explain that Amy is her own character and has been separate from Sally since forever. Jewel had a couple of tiny parallels in terms of a job here or there, but personality-wise, she is completely different from Sally. But Lanolin, this story feels like a more direct attempt at actually filling the gap that Sally has left in terms of Western Sonic storytelling. And yeah, I do think it's an actual attempt. I have listened to plenty of Bumblecasts where plenty of fans are bothering Ian about the Freedom Fighters and their inclusion, and he has pointed out that he doesn't like bringing in characters just for them to be redundant. And while people have pointed out before, yeah, there are characters that can do the jobs of certain freedom fighters, people still have a hard time filling in the role of Sally. And when you have Sonic and Pal sneaking into a giant Robotnik-run city only to have Sonic debate with the field leader on how they handle the situation, that is classic Sonic Sad AM banter. That was the Sonic-Sally dynamic of that show. And I'm not saying that's a bad thing, but I am saying the comparison is more than fair. At least it's a far more fair comparison than saying Tangle and Sally are similar because I don't know, I guess they both have short hair. I have seen that before. Don't get me wrong, I adore these new characters, and I certainly like Lanolin. And I also appreciate that while Sega will probably keep the Freedom Fighters buried, a lot of the scenarios and ideas that help make the old cast and Mobius so compelling can still inspire some fun ideas for the current comic canon. I'm always gonna like the name Robotropolis more than Eggperial City, but it is its own thing. And the idea of it growing and healing on its own, that's really cool. I do think they are pulling a lot 
up from the old Western Sonic cannons here. And that, I would argue, alone is enough reason to keep the Freedom Fighters around, considering what those characters and the creators of those characters helped establish in terms of a fun setting for Sonic. We can still take some of these other characters in different directions and let them be their own thing, even if there are parallels there. Sally was the one that made plans and sent people out on missions, while at the same time being a field leader herself. And now we have different characters filling in some of those different roles and doing it their own way. And even if yes, I will say that Lanolin in this particular situation feels the most like Sally, she is still a different character. We've only ever seen Sally be a competent leader. We rarely ever saw the growing pains of becoming that leader. That's something we get to watch with Lanolin. But yes, I have noticed a pattern of these characters grappling with the idea of leadership three times over now. But whatever, comparisons aside, there's always more room for more lady leaders in a Sonic story. I am a fan of those old characters, but I am a fan of these new ones. And I am a big fan of all of these creators. Yeah, I do whine about the Freedom Fighters a lot, and I'll probably be just as big of a pain when I finally get into the Fleetway characters when I read that comic proper. But make no mistake, I would whine just as loudly if Sega does something stupid and abandon all of these comic characters as well. And yeah, that includes Lanolin. But all that said, next time we're going to take a closer look at Team Dark, because I know people pay extra special attention whenever Shadow shows up. If anybody is sensitive about any character in the Sonic franchise, I think that character takes the cake. So we'll see how they do next time around. But until then, thank you so much for hanging out with me. Again, sorry for the big delay in content. I'm going to try and get back on track best I can here. And an extra special thank you to the patrons who have been so patient with me. Thank you guys so much for your support. And an extra special thank you to these fine folks here. Kyle Winter, Cyrus the Skeptic, Joseph Duncan Sonic 2 Blue, John, Josh Strider, Cowbell Casey, Faison Razul, Hatsworth, Ginger Bob, Jack of All Spades, Tristan Trap, Meekers, Dun Dun, Quote, Resident Fanboy, Miles the Prower, Jeremy Singer, Mr. Bujay, Sam Webster, Fish Flop, Lucas Lipker, The Bad Pal, Jonathan Dobbs, Haley, Dr. SP, here is your PSA for the week. Americans act responsibly over the three-day weekend. Everyone else, just Monday. Cecil the Glade, The Dark Neon, Stefan Plakonica, Three Monic, Graham J. Hall, Lenny X, Wayne is Boss, Lederick. Welcome to the mind of a different kind where we've been game apologisting steadily Korea Teth Cov 20 covers Heineck. Jimmy Duke STR, NBTV, Mute, Trash Baphomet, Autumn from Twitter.com, Jin Seotome, Boten, I'm not reading that, Enerjack 5, Spades the Nocturne, Ken K, Ven 101, Paxton Bisbee, Sindarin 7, Haru Specs, 3 Rule 4, Twilord, I love the Boss Baby movies, I'm their biggest fan, Paisley, Eric Delgado, Kodinsky, Jamo Art, Sayonara Robocop, Crimson Rose, Give Up Your Children, Separate, Sonic PAJ, Munisent, Godzilla, Makuta of Salt, Gleam the Anomaly, Alexander Watson, Kalei Presley, Neil Gompa, Conan Kudo, Sharif Pai, The Lex, the most powerful ship in the two universes, Native Nerd 27, Kaido Prower, Matt the Hedgehog, Now Play Pointing, Sonic and Fluffy Tails, It's Good for the Soul, Swift Cannon, Spearmint, <laughs> Gender Swap Tails is the best female Sonic character, and I will fight you if you claim otherwise. Omega Man 21, Penn Adelaide, Other Envelope, Jamie Torres Jr., Broski, and The Phantomist. Thank you guys so much for your support, and we will be back very soon with more silly videos. Toot toot, Sonic Warriors.